All right, everyone. Um, so let me just stand up. Uh, thank you very much for coming along on this uh, rainy afternoon. I don't know for how many of you it is actually a rainy afternoon. A lot of you look suspiciously dry. But for me, as I just cycled down from my flat, it was absolutely pouring down, which is why my shirt looks a bit wet. I apologize for that. Um, this event very much follows on from um, something in the same spirit that happened a year ago. So it would be quite interesting to see what kinds of changes we hear about. And uh, just in answer to a question that someone asked me as I walked in, although I was chairing that event, this actually is a different shirt, I promise you. I have more than one shirt. Okay, so um, let me see. I think the only thing I want to say to everyone is, uh, so I've heard that there's not good signal. It's maybe arbitrary, but could you make sure that your phone doesn't ring? It's fine to have it on, of course, but just put it on um, silent. So the, this, I'm going to sit down now, I think. The event has uh, two phases to it. In the first phase, each of our eight speakers is going to introduce themselves and just give you something about their perspective on the issue that we're facing tonight, which is how should scientific communication, the business of publishing and communicating our research, change? As most of you will be aware and as you'll be hearing tonight, there have already been um, a great many changes just in the last year. Uh, many of these changes are affecting the way journals behave, and it may be that those changes are already very adequate for how we want science to be in a few years' time. Perhaps they already go too far, you might say. On the other hand, it might be argued that we need more profound change than we're currently seeing. So we summarize that as evolution versus revolution. Now, it's not really fair to pigeonhole the speakers um, into one of those two categories, but nevertheless, I've done that. Just... Uh, <laughs> because it's much easier for me to keep track of things. So, <laughs> broadly speaking, and uh, no, to, to be honest, each of the speakers is very welcome to, you know, to differ from the party line, but very roughly, I've tried to invite some people who might speak about the merits of the evolutionary change we're already seeing, and it's very broadly these guys, and then some guys who might feel that we need more radical change, and that's very broadly these guys. So, um, now we go into the session, where I'm going to ask each person to try and stick to, I think I said, four minutes just to um, introduce themselves and give you something about their perspective. I think it might be interesting if we sort of dot backwards and forwards a little bit. The guys here on my uh, left, the revolutionaries, who seem surprisingly well organized for revolutionaries, um, have indicated that they'd like to speak in order going, what is it, inwards or outward? Remind me. Starting here. Starting with you. And uh, is there any particular preference that you guys have to introduce yourself? You don't mind. Okay, so why don't we just go bang, 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 um, from side to side. Um, you guys got the mic, so perhaps you guys should uh, get the privilege of going first. So, off you go. Well, thank you. Um, you can't hear anything on the microphone because there are no speakers, but apparently it's being recorded. <laughs> That's what they're telling me. So, my name is Mike Taylor. Um, in academic terms, I'm a paleontologist, and it's my privilege to work on the evolution of dinosaurs which is um, everybody else who works in evolution has dinosaur envy. So it's a nice position to be in. But because of that, I do know a bit about evolution. So before I get to the subject of this debate, I'd like to dispel a couple of evolutionary myths. So the first one is uh, the Victorians used to like to talk about scala naturi, the scale of nature, or, or the great ladder of life. And they would think about starting with very primitive organisms, and evolving cleanly and neatly in a straight line till eventually reaching the pinnacle, which of course is us. Um, but the reality is that evolution doesn't work in straight lines at all, but it's constantly branching, always giving rise to many new lineages. And of course, for everyone that succeeds, there are a hundred that go extinct before they really get up and run. <laughs> so evolution largely consists of unsuccessful experiments with the occasional lucky winner. The second misconception is that we like to think of survival of the fittest as being a very efficient process. Um, but in fact, it's terribly wasteful because not one mutation in a thousand is beneficial. And most of them kill their hosts before they're even born successfully. So the way natural selection works is by selecting on the results of purely random variation. In essence, what it does is it throws the dice repeatedly, but it only keeps the double sixes and it throws away everything else. So it's an extremely wasteful thing. Uh, and finally, we like to think of a sort of crucible of evolution, which acts as a refinery to make each species the best that it can, that it can be. Uh, and once again, it turns out that's not how things really are. The truth is that even the most successful species uh, are terribly wasteful. 
So let me give you the example of trees growing in a rainforest. Uh, they're hundreds of feet tall and they invest incredible amounts of resources into growing that tall in order to reach sunlight. But of course, they only have to do that because all the other trees are doing it. So if only they could have the intelligence to decide not to bother competing for height, they could all save all that energy and use it in other ways. So evolution is a mostly unsuccessful process, which spends most of its time going down blind alleys. Uh, it's appallingly wasteful and it produces stupidly inefficient end products that waste most of its energy doing things that aren't inherently useful. All of which means that it's an extremely good analogy for scholarly publishing. Now, the truth is, evolution is what has got us into this mess of the scholarly publishing ecosystem that we have now. So, just as humans can't <coughs> run very fast compared with other mammals, because we're locked into uh, a scheme of movement where our heels are on the floor. In the same way that the legacy publishers are locked into a way of operating and a way of thinking about information that prevents them from achieving the things that they ought to be able to do. What's actually happened is they've landed on a local maximum and they can't make it across the adaptive valley. They can't come down off that maximum to get across the valley to the much higher peak on the other side. So this is why legacy publishers give you basically electronic facsimiles of printed paper. Uh, the services that they provide are essentially the same as you would get in the 1600s. The principal difference is that they're now distributed by wire rather than by horse and cart. Uh, the product's the same, it's still a sequence of pages in a, a tiny font with little black and white images here and there. Uh, and of course the result of, of the process is you get uh, an article that's either locked behind a paywall or that you have to spend typically about $3,000 to liberate. And I think that's the result of evolution. We've got to be able to do better than that wasteful process that ends with an inefficient end result. And of course the good news is that's not a hypothetical uh, as of the last few years. We know that we can do better because we see publishers that are doing better. So Biomed Central and the Public Library of Science blazed a trail um, in open access publishing. And of course now we've got PeerJ, which uh, I hope Jason will talk about a little bit when it's his turn, which gives us born digital publications. Um, no limits on length, no limits on illustrations, everything in colour, different formats, uh, all sorts of dynamic behaviour, reviews online, and objectively superior products that instead of costing $3,000, cost $99. Well, it's a crazy discrepancy. Now, how is that possible? Well, actually, funny enough, I was talking with a, an Elsevier employer uh, earlier today uh, who made exactly the point that I want to make here, which is it's much, much easier to build something new from the ground up than to take an existing big thing and change its course. So the big publishers are like super tankers, and to turn them off the course they're on, or to put them into reverse, is a terribly lengthy process to change your metaphors. Whereas a, a new publisher that's unencumbered by everything that's gone before can move very much more quickly, can be much more agile, and as a result, can do its work at a much lower cost and produce a better result. So we have a revolution happening right in front of us. So we've seen what evolution gets us in scholarly publishing. It gets us impressed periods of a year or more. It gets us knowledge viewed as an artificially scarce resource rather than the public good. It gets us publishers so wedded to barriers that they support things like the Research Works Act. And it gets us $3,000 facsimiles. So the problem is evolution just can't get the job done. That's why we need a revolution. Very nice, very nice. Although one minute over time, just to make things. So let's see. Because um, in fact, that's how I'm going to decide the outcome. <laughs> Cameron, four minutes, go. So my name's Cameron Dalen. Um, I also actually have a research history um, in evolution, but the evolution of molecules um, and very small things. So Mike has worked on very large things. I have worked on, on very small things, but I recently left research to move to the position of, of advocacy director uh, at PLOS. I'm a radical. I think it's fairly safe to say, and people may be wondering what I'm doing on this side of the chair. I'm very often tempted to think that we need to rip the existing system down so that we can build it up from scratch again. 
But when I think that, I actually think back to a book, a poem, in fact, that I studied as a child, a um, poem by one of the leading Australian poets um, of the 70s and 80s, who none of you will have heard of, called Bruce Dorr. And he wrote a poem called Only the Beards Are Different. And what he was writing about was the results of decades of revolution in South America. And what he was referring to was the fact that when you have a revolution, when you rip things down and build them up from scratch, what you tend to get, rather than a staged and thoughtful process of preserving what is good and moving towards what is new, you actually just recreate the same power structures, the same problems, and the same systems again. So to turn to another writer, William Gibson, <coughs> the future is already here. It is just unevenly distributed. When we look back in 10 years' time, the people to my right and myself, perhaps, will be gobsmacked by how much things have changed, perhaps horrified by how much things have changed. The people to my left will probably be horrified by how little things have changed and how the same things, the sum of the same problems are still there. The system will not be perfect. It will be better, but it will not be perfect, and it never will be. The challenge we face is how to get from here to there in a way that preserves what is good, removes what is bad to the extent that we can. But we can only take one step at a time. And when we look back from a distance of 10 years, we will see those steps, and in retrospect, they will be obvious. We will see all the things that we just didn't realise today that are already there, that already exist, that became much more important. Third writer, Stephen Johnson, talks about the adjacent possible. And in a sense, he's talking about the adoption of technology. Technology is adopted by people for things they know what to do with. Radical and disruptive technologies are not radical and disruptive because people adopt them to be different or disruptive. They're radical and disruptive because people use them to do something they were already doing, but they then open up another set of possibilities. Data publication, open access publication, provenance, workflows, and identifiers, all of these are disruptive technologies which we are adopting for the purpose of ultimately disrupting the systems and making the world a much better place. So when we look back in 10 years' time, we will see the path that we followed. From where we stand at the moment, most of us actually see a corridor some steps away. I disagree. My day job is, is often to disagree with the people who are on my team. We do actually, in very many ways, want to get to some of the same places to a room which is somewhere off in this house where we can open one door at a time. And we will have a passionate disagreement over several of the issues as we go down this process. But we will only take it one step at a time. They may argue that we should go down the corridor and I may argue we should take the shortcut through the servants' quarters. But at the end of the day, we can choose to take one step forward, sideways, maybe occasionally backwards, or we can rip the whole things down again, and at the end of the day, how many of the beards will be that different? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> There's a boast here that this is going to be two minutes, which certainly not me, so we'll skip past the short. <laughs> I'm American, most of you can't understand my accent, is what I hear most of the time, that's why it's two minutes. So, <clears throat> my name is Jason Hoyt, and I started the open access uh, journal, PureJ, for one reason, and that reason is that science is getting wholesale ripped off. It costs far too much for us to be able to publish our research uh, today. So, by, uh, by definition, revolutions mean a return to a previous state, and within science, that previous state meant the immediate publication of results, and a lack of toll keepers uh, preventing us from getting access to those results. 
So my feeling is that in order to move science forward, we actually need to have a return to the past. And basically what that means is we need to return to a preprint culture where possibly peer review happens after the fact. It, this will reduce the amount of time that it takes to get our results out to the public. And if the analysts are correct, currently we're spending between nine and a half billion to ten and a half billion US dollars per year in order to publish our research. <coughs> Imagine now what we could do if we could reduce that by 80 to 90 percent. And that's what I'm trying to do with Pierre J. I co founded this with the previous publisher of Class One, which is the world's largest open access journal. Pierre J, as Mike said, we charge just $99 for authors to be able to publish not once, not twice, not three times, but for the rest of their life, their entire careers. $99 just to be able to publish. And what this is doing for universities, for academics, is it means that for the price of a normal year subscription to a journal, they're able to give faculty uh, subscriptions to Pure J to publish for the rest of their careers. So, in addition to that, the $99, what we're also doing with Pierre J is we're introducing preprints. One of our feelings is that we need to stop doing the peer review dance, which usually takes six to 12 months or more in order to get our results published. With preprints then, we're able to get things out and see things in a platform uh, immediately. On top of that, we can democratize the peer review process by being able to see uh, people's feedback uh, on these preprints. But on top of that, we know that peer review is not going to go away and it has its benefits as well. Uh, with peer review, at Peer J, we believe that things need to be open. And so we give the reviewers of the system the option to name them themselves next to their peer reviewed articles. And what we want to do then is to incentivize a reputation system uh, in order to improve not only the quality and the accountability of what is being reviewed, but the transparency, which we think will, will actually reduce the number of errors, fraudulent results in science. Uh, that's it. Oh, I was close to two minutes. That was uh, three, three minutes, minutes but that's still fantastic. <laughs> that, um, I would, in my mind, I'd be getting a bit obsessed with time. Um, <laughs> Jason. Wow, that caught me by surprise. I wasn't ready to stand up and start talking. Right? Um, my name is Jason Wild. I'm from Nature. And basically, I want to say that initially, I'm from a commercial publisher. I'm from Nature Publishing Group. But I believe in open science. And my view is that we're on the right path. We're on a path of change. Science will change. And I totally agree with Cameron. And in 10 years' time, we will look back and things will be very different. And we will probably think sometimes, how do we get there? But we'll also think that was the right thing to do. But I believe the change we should be making, the change that should be taking place, is a slow and considered change. Not too slow, but not too quick. The right type of change. And the reason for that is that evolution, whilst Mike said that evolution takes many branches, evolution tries many different experiments to see what works. And for those experiments that don't work, it stops them and doesn't go back and retry them because it's learnt and it's understood and it knows where we should be and what we should be doing. Revolution, on the other hand, is an abrupt change. It's a change that happens very suddenly and doesn't take into account the environment around it and can actually make problems or cause instabilities that don't actually fit with what you're trying to do. And sometimes, actually, from the beard debate that we've already talked about, unfortunately I don't have a beard, but from the beard debate we've already talked about, one revolution is followed by another revolution is followed by another revolution and long periods of instability that don't actually help the environment where the revolution is happening. But I just want to highlight a couple of cases to explain why I think evolution is better than revolution. The first is for revolution to really happen and to really work, you need to take society, you need to take everything along with you on that journey of the revolution. Now, if you look at data, for us, if you look at what our authors say, so we actually periodically poll our authors, we get information back from them. And we ask them, so what are the main criteria for you choosing what you do with your research and where you publish your research? And the bits that they say are normally what you'd expect, which is the reputation of the journal, about 96% of authors say that. 
the relevance of the title to my discipline. About 95% of authors say that. The quality of peer review, that's a really interesting one, going against what Jason said. 93% of authors say that peer review is very important to them, and the quality of that review is important to them. Interestingly enough, the lowest factor for any scientist is that their funder or somebody else mandates that they do something. And that's 15% of our audience say that. And so for a revolution to happen, you've got to bring the ground with you. And it seems that the ground isn't there yet for revolutions to happen. But I talked initially about instability and that revolution takes an abrupt change. And an example of that is just not thinking about what authors or anybody else around you may actually want. So this is some data that we have, and I'll try and summarise it. I've got very detailed information in front of me that I'm going to try and boil down on the fly, which is going to be really scary. But for one of our journals, Scientific Reports, which launched a couple of years ago, we offered, when we initially started, two licences for open access, two very restrictive licences, I'll be honest, the No Derivatives and the Share Alike licence. The authors were free to choose and were free to choose. And over the first period of time, which was um, probably the first five months, the authors chose 73% chose share alike and 27% chose no derivatives, which is what you'd expect. They chose a more free license that we had on offer. But in July of last year, we changed and we added the third license ahead of RCUK and everything else. We added the, BBOM, the CCBY license. So we then had CCBY, CCBY, NC, SA, CCBY, NC, ND. And looking at how authors chose that, they chose it very differently. So BY was chosen by 5%. Share alike, which was 73% previously, fell to 37%. And no derivatives, which was 27% previously, increased to 58%. Now, as a publisher, I was astounded by that. I couldn't believe it. So what we thought was, OK, we'll reorder the license types on the form. And I'm really over my time, so I'm going to be really fast now. And we reordered the license types on the form to actually decide, was it a fluke? And over a same time period, what we found was, after we reordered it, to shift the licenses around so we could factor out that, 5% still chose BY. Interestingly enough, SA fell to 11%. And no derivatives increased to 83%. Now, I'm not saying this is scientifically accurate. I'm not saying <coughs> this is statistically correct. What I'm trying to say, though, is that there is a vast proportion of authors out there who want to put some protection on their rights. I do believe that as publishers we have to explain what those rights are. I believe as publishers and as an industry we probably haven't done a great job at doing that. But I believe that evolution is the right course of action, not revolution. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Interesting statistics. It's like the old time had that might not Okay. <laughs> Let it go, man. No. Live in the oh. nail. <laughs> All right. Amelia. Hello. Thank you. My name is Amelia Amstotten and I'm in the business of selling future, much like academics and researchers and perhaps also publishers. I'm an elected member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party. And I would like to um, take a different perspective on this um, debate. So we're talking about evolution versus revolution, as if we are revolutionaries and they are the ones moving slow. But if you look at the field of intellectual property rights, with the copyright, with the copyright evolution in the last 20 years from a legislative perspective, um, the database rights that were introduced in 1997 by the European Commission, it is clear that we have completely revolutionized the, the landscape for controlling information in law. Um, we heard by the introductory talk by the moderator that um, we're seeing evolutionary changes in how we deal with knowledge and communication in society. That isn't true. Um, it's always been uncertain to be a user of information and a user of culture. It is still uncertain to be a user of culture, information, and um, 
general scientific publications. Um, legacy publishing is actually not muddling along inefficiently. It is doing very, very proficient lobbying activities with our legislators. And I note that but the previous speaker refers to authors. Well, so, uh, okay, so the authors are choosing some particular type of licensing scheme. Um, that could just as easily be explained by the general psychological effects of our society debate. And I guess for the publisher, it doesn't really matter what the authors do, because actually what you're doing right now is heavily exploiting database rights that are keeping data mining in Europe um, at a slow pace. We know that we're lagging behind both the US and Japan in our database industry and data mining industrial developments in Europe. Um, so I find that actually disingenuous and um, I would prefer not to have that in the debate right now. Um, so uh, we also heard that revolution doesn't take into account society around it. But then again, tying back to how the publishing industry is treating our legislative institutions, please take that into account. Because actually most of the revolutions that you've caused to happen in our copyright framework in the last 20 years have been completely at odds with how scientists see themselves using information, how citizens see themselves using information, and how we could build um, <coughs> new industries and, uh, well, a more friendly and communicative society. Um, so I deal with these, uh, I deal with these plights every day, and even if I agree that the ground for revolution isn't quite here yet, I would argue that if we could get rid of the publishers, um, the ground for uh, a true revolution, which takes the user's rights into account and takes new ideas and lays the groundwork for that, that might actually be possible. But then you will please recall your representatives from Brussels first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very punchy and lovely in that it was quite short. All right, so let's go over to Graham. Hi, um, I'm Graham Taylor and I promise to speak for four minutes. Um, I've been a publisher for 40 years, so I, I can't help it if that's where um, I come from. And latterly, I, I was director of uh, academic publishing at the UK Publishers Association since 2001, which is when the um, open access debates began. Um, my thesis is very simple. It's that science needs publishing and publishing needs publishers. Science evolves by its very nature, so publishing does too, and so do publishers, and it's happening all around us. Scholarly publishers come in all shapes and sizes, about 2,000 of them, I believe, but they have some things in common. They have current costs that need to be recovered, and they have investment needs that need to be funded. And we have to ask precisely how this is to be achieved. Um, the answer will define where we're going and also what will last, unfortunately. Um, peer review is the sine qua non of science and science publishing. It's what distinguishes us from mere magazines and Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, how is this to be organised for what are in effect three million submissions um, each year for publication? Um, how are the outcomes of science to be collected and preserved? Um, the outcomes of science publishing, not um, because of anything we do, um, have come to be used as the metric for research, or a metric for research quality. Is there an alternative that is? I heard about it this afternoon, but how much traction has it got so far? Um, and also, I have to say, scholarly publishing in the UK is an unashamed success story. Um, we're a big uh, for the UK economy, and we need that. But how are we going to keep that going in the future? I'd argue that even science can't exist in a um, commerce-free bubble, so a sustainable market in science publishing has got to be surely a sensible strategy to aim at. And we need workable, collaborative solutions to, to achieve that. Evolution has taken us this far, and I believe it will carry us forwards. Publishers have to innovate and, and experiment in order to survive, and there's more of that going on right now than at any time in my 40 years. Open access is arriving, and I would say it's arriving as much by market forces as it is by funded mandates, although that obviously helps the accelerator. 
I think the direction of travel was clear, but the speed of the journey less so, I would say. Curiously, the web was born at CERN um, from a desire to facilitate <coughs> scientific communication. As a side effect, it's profoundly disrupted retailing, um, newspapers, the music industry, but curiously less so scientific publishing, so far at least. There has to be a reason for that. Peer-reviewed <coughs> science publishing began in 1665 at the Royal Society and the outputs have grown inexorably at 3% compound ever since, producing 2 million articles published annually each year. But science publishing is about much more than production and distribution of those 2 million articles. It's about the registration of conclusions, it's about the dissemination of opinions, the validation of results through peer review, filtration effect of editorial standards, the navigation to conclusions of relevance, and, of course, the archival record on whose shoulders we can all stand. So, arguably, science publishing fulfills a cultural and sociological function, and it's that that's harder to disrupt. Our government has recently evolved an open access policy, a gold open access policy, based on article publication charges. The first government on the planet, rather bravely, to do so as David Willits himself has said, only gold unambiguously achieves the objective of open access for taxpayer-funded research when it is published. Publishers, I know, stand ready to implement this policy, and with some reservations, I think the universities as well. The interesting question, given the sociological issues I've touched on, is where do researchers stand on this? This is your work that's at stake here. What will you do? Would you rather publish yourself? Will you join the revolution? Or will you evolve with the rest of us? The outcome, essentially, is in your hands. Paul Wicks, and I'm here from the internet to negotiate the terms of your surrender. Um, <laughs> the reason for this is not for publications, not for PDFs, not for profits, it's for patients. And the reason for that is, as uh, our friend ePatient Dave has told us, that patient is not a third person term. Many of us in the room are old enough to know that term, or either ourselves or someone being close to has been affected by a serious disease. You have that moment in the waiting room when you're looking around, wondering what everyone else has, and the doctor spouts out some bit of Latin at you that, that now is going to become an important part of your, your life. And you want to know, why did this happen to me? What am I going to do next? Am I a typical patient? What, what do I do now? My experience of publishing has, has come from the perspective of a neuropsychologist working in a disease called motor neuron disease, or MND. MND is a rare terminal illness that affects people in middle age. Prognosis is unfortunately between two and five years, and there's no effective treatment for it. Um, we've had a number of clinical trials over the years. Unfortunately, about a, a third of them actually kill patients faster than placebo, so it's a very difficult area to work in. So, Bear in mind this when I say that in 2008, a peer-reviewed uh, paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science saying, uh, and this is the title, Lithium Carbonate Delays the Progression of ALS, or motor neuron disease. And this was a study done in only 16 treated patients against 28 controls. And in the graph, it very clearly showed that patients on this drug, lithium carbonate, which is widely used to treat mood disorders, um, almost halted the progression of this disease. Over the course of 15 months, none of those patients died, compared to the uh, control group in whom a third of them died. Now, if you had seen this paper and you were a patient diagnosed with motor neuron disease, what would you do? Would you wait for the replication? Would you wait for the large phase three randomized control trial? Would you go and find your doctor or grandpa by the lapels and insist that he prescribe this drug for you? Well, that's exactly what happened. So from the 16 patients in this uh, PNAS study, 160, 10 times that sample, took to the internet and started using Google spreadsheets to crowdsource how they were doing by taking this drug. And they compared themselves to historical data they took from the site that I work at, patients like me. 
It turns out in that disease, there's a patient reported outcome, a questionnaire that you could take between 12 questions is as good as an assessment that a clinician can perform. We actually took over the analysis of patients like me and created new tracking tools which would allow people to do the side effects, the dosages, the blood plasma concentrations, and we put it all open. We could, everyone could see everyone's data, you could click down and drill down to every individual data source of this citizen science-led study. What we found was that lithium <coughs> appeared not to halt the progression of ALS. It had almost no effect. Fortunately, it didn't make things any worse. What was interesting was from the scientific perspective, <coughs> the view was to ignore this. That this was self-experimentation, it was a bunch of anecdotes, it wasn't controlled, we didn't know, you know exactly what type of lithium they had. So the traditional scientific perspective would have been to throw that information out. We were able to show within about six to nine months that lithium was not having an effect. That was before the ink was dry on the ethics submission from the five randomized control trials that were then brought out by the traditional medical community. It took them three years to complete those, it cost us some $20 million in five countries, all of them were halted for futility. So I think this shows that there's some potential here to think not just about you know, what do academics want, but to say that patients actually increasingly can use tools like this to take command of their disease and start doing the work. When you bring down the pain walls, patients will go in and start critiquing clinical trials. They notice that the uh, standard deviations don't look quite right on documents. They notice that these images look a little bit inconsistent. And actually having many eyes, particularly the eyes of people living with conditions, I think it is a good way of uh, improving quality. Um, this isn't for every condition, it's not for every disease, because most conditions don't have one of these wonderful questionnaires that maps well to a uh, clinician's experience. That's why patients like me, we're very lucky to say we've just received funding from the Robert Johnson Foundation to make a, a new platform which will allow researchers to trial new questionnaires, to have patients give feedback on them and to prototype them in real time. All of those instruments will be licensed under Creative Commons, so they'll be free for anybody to use forever, and any uh, work done on that platform has to be uh, done under those terms. Just to close with a quote from uh, e-patient Dave again, uh, the issue here is not so much about the, the final product, but the issue here is that patients, when they volunteer for research, give their safety, their lives, and their time to contribute their data, to be a data donor. And I think it's important that they can't access their own data. So as e-patient Dave would say, give me my damn data. It's about me, so it's mine. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is David Tempest. I'm from Elsevier. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been at the, uh, the conference today, but I was actually polishing my super tanker most of the day. Um, I'm basically here as from one of the biggest publishers in the world. And, you know, it, we have had a very long history of publishing subscription journals. And over the last few years, I've been involved with understanding and, and, and uh, introducing a test and learn approach within Elsevier to understand what it is that our authors want as the, the system begins to change and evolve. And we've taken our time and we've looked at what people want and we've spent time speaking to all of the different um, stakeholders in the world. So we've talked to funders, we've talked to governments, we've talked to patients and we've talked to fundamentally the people who provide our information which is our researchers. And we know that there are a number of researchers who have no interest in an evolution or indeed a revolution because they're very happy in the way that they can publish um, in journals and also how they can publish books as well. But we also recognise that there is a percentage of people out there who do want evolution and do want revolution. And so we have to cater for those people. Um, to go back to the, um, the super tanker um, idea, we have a big tanker. We have a big collection of articles that sit on our tanker. And over the last three to four years, we have been engineering tugs to help us to move that tanker. And what we've done is we've created a set of tugs that are efficient to move us very quickly. And so over the last years, six months especially, Elsevier has been moving very quickly to embrace many of the aspects that open access um, 
have been suggested and what our researchers are looking for. But that doesn't mean that we're going to push all the container units over the side of the super tanker from our subscription business. We have to continue to enhance and maintain that. So fundamentally what we're going to have to do is to continue to launch subscription-based journals for those people who need them and also to launch uh, open access based material for people who need them. It's an, an evolution of one sense and it is a progression of a, a system that has existed, as, as someone said, since the 16th century. Of course, in the 16th century, there was no added value there. There was no discoverability, there was no searchability. There was no peer review quality enhancement. There was no navigation tools to find your way through. And you know, that is a completely different picture to what it is now, uh, irrespective of whether you're looking at a subscription or an open access product. So what I'm trying to indicate here is that yes, Elsevier as a big company, we have been listening and we have been speaking to a lot of people. And we know that there's still a lot of way to go. And there's many of our other publishers would say exactly the same thing. But we are changing. We are going to continue our existing mechanisms and we will listen to people and our customers and all of the different practitioners that other people have mentioned in order to provide the service that we think we need to within the publishing industry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all our participants for those very thought-provoking um, short pieces. Now, for the rest of um, our event, what we'll be doing is working our way through um, five different questions, really, which the organisers, um, including me, have come up with uh, in order to capture what we feel are the, the usual talking points. And this is the chance now for the members of the panel here to interact with one another and contradict one another and so forth. Um, we hope to spend about 10, 10, 12 minutes on each of these questions, and I'll um, certainly be inviting questions from you guys. So let me, uh, without further ado, let me just kick off with the first one. So let me read it from my screen here. There are, there are members of the public who need to access scientific research as soon as it emerges. When such research is publicly funded, surely we must find a way to make it immediately available to all. So I think um, I'm going to come over here because this really does seem to be in your area, Paul. So. Thank you. So I, I'd go even further than that and say it's not just publicly funded research, but I would argue privately funded research too, particularly from my perspective, from the uh, perspective of, of a pharmaceutical company. Um, so uh, I think there's been an interesting movement that's happened over the last 10 years. It's called the e-patient movement, or e-engaged uh, patient. And originally it started st st for electronic. But now it stands for empowered and engaged, and um, it, it's a group that really started off on the internet, on using online forums, and it's particularly prevalent in areas like cancer, uh, in autism, in Asperger's, uh, in sort of misunderstood conditions like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, psychiatric conditions, uh, this type of thing. And there are um, a subset of, of these people who are very interested in learning more about their condition and who do a great job of educating the rest of the community. I think thinking of, of patients or the public as some sort of other uh, is a mistake that, that we can easily fall into. Um, uh, there's a, a friend of mine who has a PhD in Parkinson's disease and he now has Parkinson's disease. But because he's not in a university setting, he can no longer keep up to date. What is the latest animal model research? What is going on with his genetic mutations? Uh, what is the, the risk and, and side effect profiles of, of those uh, medications that he could choose from? So increasingly you'll hear from the NHS and, and other healthcare systems that patients need to take responsibility, need to take more control of their condition, but they can't do that with an information imbalance. And of course a lot of these things are very complicated, but I would argue that, that people can learn. The winner of, of the TED Prize this year um, put a computer in a hole in the wall in an Indian slum and within a week illiterate slum children had taught themselves the basics of uh, genetics. Uh, just through online systems that could uh, recursively adapt to their needs. So I do think there is the potential to try and meet the public, as it were, halfway, and I think that that should be part of our mission, that the publications and the scientific output that get professors promoted are not the end goal. Okay. Would anyone from this side care to engage with the question? 
Um, <clears throat> well, I think we agreed to, I would um, <laughs> uh, try and lead off on, on this. Um, I don't think there is anybody in this room, cer certainly on our side here, who is trying to deliberately deny um, anybody access to information that um, may be of um, life-saving import. Um, I, as I tried to say earlier, the direction of travel is very clear, with, which is towards um, open access. The question is the, the speed of the journey. And I, I think the point at issue here is, is, is immediate access. Um, and uh, you could argue that open access, the imperative for open access, began in the medical area anyway, and, and has grown and evolved out from there. And we can point to all sorts of developments that have leveraged that. Um, the largest funder in the UK is the Wellcome Trust um, for, I believe, for biomedical research. And they were the first with a gold open access policy um, and a, also a tight green requirement on, on their um, research authors which is um, a deposit in PubMed Central within six months. Um, the National Institutes of Health in the, in the US were, were the first US agency to impose a mandate on, on their funded researchers. Um, this one was 12 months for um, deposit into, into PubMed Central. This is a direction of travel and um, the only one that answers um, the question immediate um, is funded gold open access, which is now the policy of the UK as of last Monday, um, and um, is being talked up in many other places as well, probably first of all in, in Europe. So um, we're moving along those lines. Um, the publishers in the UK um, are working on a public library initiative whereby um, it will be a terminal um, service, I'm afraid, it won't be an internet based service, um, but um, uh, many biomedical journals will be available through the public libraries and, and that will be new. Um, I would also say that the research councils actually have a role to play here if they, if they want to. Um, what the public has funded, of course, is the primary research. The publishers would argue that the peer-reviewed article that um, appears um, has been the product of investment through the publishing process. Um, PRJ wants to charge $99 for that. Um, Mike Taylor has said it costs $3,000, I think that's probably the going rate. The Finch Report, for those of you who know about that, um, put a benchmark figure for estimation purposes of about $2,000. Um, we're now in a different market, and I'm sure that rate will come down through market forces. So we will see more gold open access, which means in more immediate free access for those who might need it. So this is where we're going. I think what is going to be most beneficial from the patient point of view is, is there's still the navigation and discovery issue. I said earlier there are two million articles published on the globally each year. There are three million submissions. There's a huge great swamp of, of research outputs out there. How do you find your way through it? to what you want and you, you need. Um, good publishing is about that. It's in the metadata, the discovery elements and so forth. And there's a lot of work goes on in that area as well in terms of organizing platforms and, and getting standards in place. But my final point would be this. I have a suspicion what's needed is an intermediary kind of operation as opposed to um, navigation through the primary, um, the great, great mass of primary research outputs. There has been a, an initiative in the US, I think, called Patient Informed, which is trying to do just that. It's trying to make sure that the potentially life-enhancing articles are immediately available. 
and are written in a style that can be understood, um, none of us are allowed to say that most research articles can't be understood apart from by a handful of people for whom they're written. And I'm not saying that. But um, uh, it, there's a great deal of scope for what you might call journalism, actually, as, as well as research in this area. So we're getting there. We all want to get there. And I'm sure we're all on the same side in this one. Really. Okay. So I might tap me on the shoulder to let you know that he wants to briefly respond to that. And then I'm going to invite anyone who'd like to comment on this topic, which is really broadly the question of open access. Um, yeah. to, Step up and do so. It is brief and it's very broad as well. I just want to make the point that as academics we can get terribly uh, sort of tied into our own circle and we think that the purpose of research is for us to get papers in journals and to get grants and get promotion and all the rest of it. But of course all of that is a byproduct of the real purpose. The reason the public pays us to do these things is so that the public can get the response. So it's great that that's increasingly acknowledged in the case of um, health research and that we're at least moving in a good direction, if not fast enough. But it also applies to every area of research that the public funds. So I know about small businesses, for example, who are crippled in their ability to, to make the right decisions because they can't get hold of uh, journal articles. I know of a guy who's a fossil preparator, whose job is getting fossil bones out of rocks, and who's in danger of damaging irreplaceable specimens because he can't get the necessary information. And I could go on, and I'd encourage you to look at who needs access.org for all sorts of examples of those. So we just need, to, I hope we will all be aware as academics that actually we don't do this just for ourselves, we do it for the public that funds it. Okay, so broadly within this question of does the public need immediate access, free access to academic publications, um, would anyone like to ask a question? Hand up, please. So I can see two, actually three. Um, but you caught my eye first, so it's you, sir. Um, so as an academic, I often find that trying to read a paper without yeah. access to the... Actually, why don't I ask Victoria to do a bit of running around, because I think it would be interesting to capture these questions if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, so as an academic, I often find it's very difficult to read a paper if you don't have access to the papers that have come before it. So even if we are moving to a model where we have open access, um, what is going to happen to all the papers that are still on the super tanker? Okay, so that's a nice short question. Um, let's come over here. Would someone like to engage with that? What are we going to do about the papers, and many of them very interesting papers, that are before the evolutionary change? Um, well, there's a lot of journals that operate under what we would call open archives and make content freely available after a specific time period, depending on the journal. Many publishers have done that and are making lots and lots of previous papers available for free um, across the internet. So I think that's one way that that has been enabled. There's also, of course, another way that um, uh, there's lots of new mechanisms coming out to en enhance access, one of them being um, a rental model. So um, people can actually go and rent articles for a very, very low cost, sometimes even pound, one pound fifty, um, and gain access to the information that they may want to, and that means that they may not know that that's exactly the paper they want to read, but most would be prepared to pay a pound to see that, to see exactly the, the paper that they want to, to, to use. Um, so that rental option is also out there, so there's free access, there's rental access, and there's many other forms of access that publishers are putting in place to enhance that. Okay, so I have a quick comment from this side. Very quick, and, and the snarky ones liven up the, the debate. The answer is put Elsevier out of business because as soon as that happens, all of their content is made open access. By <laughs> 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 that is revolutionary. <laughs> um, okay, great. So, um, all right. Uh, did, yeah, yeah, the microphone. Um, Thank you. So um, a very quick one, perhaps. Yes, David Tempest uh, said he talked to lots of people, in, including those who had provided uh, Elsevier's data, namely the researchers. Uh, I would ask him, rather, isn't it the researchers' data, the researchers' information, not Elsevier's information? Okay. No, of course it's the researchers' information. Um, we, have to add, we do add value to that, but it, of course it's the researchers' information. It's, their intellectual property and 
we are enabling the dissemination and the certification of that. So absolutely, it, it is the lead safety problem. Okay, um, Amelia would like to say something, either. Um, well, so the control over communications and information is actually a politically very contentious issue, which is the entire intellectual property rights um, debate. And I think it's not only in the academic community, but everywhere else in society also, that we don't know who we want to be controlling what information. Um, Elsevier, by sitting on all of these uh, publishing right, publishers' rights that they have, uh, recording labels that have performers' rights, what is it like database rights, all of these things, are a way of controlling information through legislation. Uh, but then you also have stuff like patients like me, which puts all of the information of private persons on the internet, which technically, I guess you could argue, gives an individual better control over what they know about the specific hospital condition. Um, but we who follow intelligence community debates would know that also the NSA, the National Security Agency of, of uh, the United States, or uh, whatever you have, that like GCHQ or so in the UK, they also know all of that stuff, and they're able to make very extensive map on the large population groups. So actually, largely when we discuss communication and information politically, we always lose track of that the most reasonable political stance in any society for the good of the society is that the individual has the largest amount of control of their information. But we have no legal framework to accomplish this, and we are also unwilling to guide industrial models and market models um, and our legislative development to accomplish that. And it's one of the biggest challenges that we have now with our, like how we deal with, especially in an information society, we need to have that political debate, um, and not just in terms of open access, evolution and revolution, but like all over the place. Okay. Thank you. And then, Cameron, did you want to just say quickly a word and then we must move on? Well, just in, in terms of the question of the debate, revolution or evolution, we have the mechanisms to solve these problems. They exist, they work. We have publishers who can create a viable business model, creates work, goes immediately online, that is available to people to transform <coughs> and migrate into other places and create the discovery paths that bring people through to that research content. We heard a lot of interesting stories today in the, in the crowdsourcing session about how do we bring research through to the people who are involved in citizen science, how do we take the insights from citizen science through those systems. And we have the systems in place to do this. Many of these things already work in particular places. The future is already here, we just need to figure out which bits of it the ones to follow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so I think what we'll do is, and there's, there will be, always be opportunities to sort of come back to some of these questions depending on how time goes, but I do want to give each of our questions a fair crack. So I'm going to move on to the next one. So the, uh, reading from my screen again, the statement we have here is that uh, increasingly funders and even political leaders are starting to specify how scientists must publish their work. But are the newer publishing models necessarily in the best interests of science? For example, if a journal gets a fixed fee for every paper published, won't uh, publish everything culture emerge? So this question is kind of motivated by some of my academic colleagues who actually come up with this concern. So I'm going to this time come over to this side and see who would like to engage with that person. So from our side, I've, I've been nominated to engage with this. So are new publishing models a better way of dealing with changes within the landscape of access to content and the mandates that are coming out there. And would we ever see a situation where, if there is a fixed fee per paper, the commercial drive to make money would mean that you would accept everything to make money regardless of what that paper was or what that paper said. I don't think that scenario would ever happen with a credible publisher. I don't see any publisher around the table, I, don't, I know from my point of view at Nature, but from any publisher that you can think of, they would want to undermine their business, undermine their reputation, undermine their model by accepting everything. Or just saying, this money, they're paying money, I'm going to accept it. Models like <coughs> Floss, Scientific Reports, um, Springer Open, those journals which are looking at just technical correctness in an article you would have expected that actually the majority of stuff that is sent to a publisher to publish is technically correct. 
and we referee for technical correctness, I know PLOS referee for technical correctness, from discussions between both of us, it seems that we accept about 60% of the content that comes through, around about that level. That means 40% of whatever's submitted from scientists is actually technically incorrect. No publisher would want to publish that, and I don't agree that the models where publishers would do that would happen, so I don't think that that would happen. But I think what will happen is that new publishing models will come out. The publishing model that PeerJ has, which is a very intelligent, clever way of trying to spin how you pay money, who pays money, how money is paid. I think that is a great model and a very interesting one. And we'll see how it works, like evolution. You know, there are experiments. All publishers are experimenting with different things. Nature Publishing Group experimented with Nature Proceedings, which was a free preprint server that anybody could put anything on. Lots of scientists didn't do it. In actual fact, the only preprint server that really works is the one in physics. It's archive, and that works phenomenally well. In life sciences and chemistry, it doesn't work. Open access in chemistry, forgive me if there are chemists in the audience, but no chemist really sees a point of open access if you talk to them and if you look at the data that comes back from chemistry. So communities see things different. There are going to be different challenges. I mean, I'm conscious of how far I overran last time, so I'm not going to overrun too much this time or we'll lose the debate. But um, from the point of view of what I think, I think if we look at a, if we look at a future and a pure green OA, a pure gold OA future, do I believe that that is going to be the case? What I honestly believe is that we will have a mixed economy. We'll have an economy where there may still be some titles that are subscription only. They may be very, very, very high profile titles that have very few authors and very many readers. And where does it make sense to charge? It may make sense not to charge the authors, but to charge the readers. And charge the readers a reasonable rate. We're seeing $99 seems a reasonable rate. That's the subscription price for nature. You know, it's, that could be the right type of model. But also, I think what happens in a mixed economy, if an economy where we've got many entrants and we've got much more mobile ability for businesses to come in and come out, is that you end up with competition and you end up with choice. And if the authors have choice, what that does for all the publishers is create competition. And where there's competition, there's innovation. And where there's innovation, there's evolution, and that's where I think we are, and that's where I think we'll be. Okay, just before I hand over to the other side, uh, is there anyone here a chemist? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, mic up one of these chemists. Victoria, take the mic to someone who's uh, not, who doesn't mind answering a quick question from me. That guy there. I'm a chemist and an access publisher, so I... Oh, there we go. So, okay, that might not be... Uh, who else is a chemist? Who's <laughs> <laughs> a chemist but not an open access publisher? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyone? Uh, this, so, yeah. yeah. Really Victoria, Victoria, Victoria. Yeah. Okay. okay, so yeah. I just want... An, yeah, let's try. So... <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so... Yeah, Doug, what do you think? Um, is it fair to say that chemists are very backward when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> I think there's I think the, the, I think the, I think the, I think the statistical data are very clear that the uptake by chemists of OA has been very low and the general level of interest in these matters has been close to non-existent among chemists and as I said in the speeches this morning most of all of this stuff is about changing cultural norms. Some need to change more greatly and more quickly than others. That is clearly the case. And why? Is, would you care to speculate just quickly? Why is it that the chemists have this different... Is it simply the way cultures have evolved? I, 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 I strongly suspect that cultural uh, inertia has mm -hmm. been much to do with it. Okay. Interesting. All right. So, um, over to this side. Who's going to tackle this question for us? Well, I was going to, and uh, I prepared a bunch of things to say, which you, Jason, then said almost word for word, all the things I was going to say. Except, of course, that you finished by saying, where there's innovation, there's evolution, whereas I would have said, where there's innovation, there's revolution. So actually, I'm, I'm going to help you get back on time by not adding anything to that. I'm, I'm wholly in agreement with this one point I would like to make, which is that Nature Proceedings accepted 5,000 reprints in five years. As far as I could see, it was going very well. And I actually submitted a preprint 
and it closed one week later. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to know whether it was my fault. <laughs> what was the reason for closing it? I believe we had two prints submitted by somebody called Mike Taylor. <laughs> the system to end. I think what we see, there was a lot of interest in metric proceedings at the very beginning. And if you look at where those submissions came, they come earlier on in the five year cycle. Towards the end of it, in actual fact, there wasn't that much traffic. The user traffic for content in that and the material that was being deposited was getting slower and slower and slower. And we were finding that less people were using it. That was where we came at. From, this, from that decision. And also, a lot of it is life sciences and we're seeing a bigger move to OA and it seems that people are more comfortable with getting their research out there after being peer reviewed and nature proceedings didn't do that. Okay. The interesting discussion that we're having, am I allowed to start? Go on, finish. The interesting discussion that we're having now is about should preprints come back and would preprints solve some of the patient problems that have been discussed earlier which this science can publish in life sciences and other areas initially online online without peer review and then get picked up like they do in the physics community would that help those types of situations we've heard from librarians earlier today about RCUK and the funding and the block funding and that Oxford University librarians are wanting to encourage their researchers to use green OA rather than gold OA to conserve funding and to ensure that they can continue to support what they're trying to, to achieve. So there is an interesting question, which is should preprints come back and should they come back strongly in the life sciences, which has always resisted them. Okay. So uh, I guess what we're talking about at the moment is different models of publishing, uh, different cultures that may be out there in the spectrum of different sciences. And um, also the, the question of to what extent we're comfortable with mandates coming down from funders and government. So anything within broadly in this area, does anyone like to put a comment to the panel? Um, yep, let's jump in. Thank you. Um, so one of the themes that I saw coming out, this is on the culture for okay. the culture aspect. So one of the themes I saw coming out was uh, this question of how the researchers themselves talk. So on the, on the bright side, three people have talked about how uh, different people and uh, different researchers have not seen to be uh, so enthusiastic that there's not um, ND or SA, uh, over SA on the research. But it seems like there's a really obvious debunking explanation for this, which is there's a principal agent problem. Right? So the researchers themselves are not, uh, are not at the librarian position where they're paying for the journal. So from their point of view, the costs are, are invisible, right? Um, so the very expensive costs are borne, a, uh, borne by the institution and only derivatively to them, but not directly to them. So that's why they don't see the problem and that's why they don't want, they don't have these uh, strong opinions. So it seems to me that that would be a very easy explanation. So I have uh, one of the three of you to respond. All right. Um, would one of you guys care to comment briefly on that? Okay. Um, I think, yes, there's a lot of researchers who would not, um, wouldn't know about the, the cost of the library. Um, I think you're right there. I remember going to a, a research lab in the US um, and asking one of the clinicians there, what do you think about open access? And he says, oh, it's great, I've got access to everything that I, I, I actually want. And I said, well, can you show me what you mean? And it was because he was looking into his library catalogue and to him, he did have ex access to everything that he had. Hmm. So, yes, I, I agree, you know, that, that is not often a thing that researchers realise. Um, but librarians have, have, have really changed the, the, the impetus in the universities and they're much more involved now with um, promoting um, journal culture and working with academics rather than being very much um, the older traditional kind of form of librarianship they've moved towards being much more about search and delivery and understanding and i think they're making a difference and they're illustrating the costs involved in the system to the researchers it will take time but i think librarians are doing that and we've seen how Oxford University are moving towards a green open access uh, policy, um, they're also making it aware very clearly to their researchers exactly how much it costs to, to publish gold as well. Um, and there's many other universities are doing this as well. So I think it's more obvious within an open access world, but let's not forget that librarians have been working on that 
uh, to illustrate other costs as well. Okay. So um, I'll come to you in a second. Oh, unless it's very quick. It's very quick. Okay. Victor, wait for the mic. Though. <coughs> I'm glad David Tempest is so interested in librarians being able to make costs transparent to their users because at my university, Imperial College, my chief librarian cannot tell me how much she pays for Elsevier journals because uh, she's bound by confidentiality clause. Would you like to uh, address that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm certainly going to have to invite a response to that. <clears throat> well, indeed, there are uh, confidentiality clauses um, inherent in the system um, in, in our freedom collections. Um, <coughs> <laughs> but the, the freedom collections do give a lot of choice and there is a lot of discount in there to the librarians and the use and the cost for use has been dropping dramatically year on year and so we have to ensure that um, in order to have fair competition between um, different countries that we have uh, this level of confidentiality to make that work Otherwise, everybody will drive down, drive down, drive, 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 and that would mean that. From, from, from the point of view, um, it questions the sustainability of journals. Mm. And do we want to see journals disappear completely um, through that, or do we want to maintain a sustainable system? It's the same in open access. There has to be sustainability within the system as well. Okay, but it's a fair response. Uh, oh. What's happening? I just I just want to touch on this ethical question because I think it's a really it really digs to the, to the corner thing. As a researcher, um, when I went to Doug and asked for a grant to run a project, and and I asked for a piece of equipment, um, I once asked for the top end piece of equipment, which was three hundred fifty thousand pounds versus two hundred twenty thousand pounds, and the referees rightly took us to pieces and said, exactly why do you need this bell and that whistle? This is public money. You need to be spending this appropriately. You need to make sure you're justifying the costs of this process. And I think it's actually really incumbent on us as researchers spending public money for the purpose of buying services and scholarly communication that we are aware of that we ensure that we understand and choose those services on the basis of getting good value for money um, for that public investment. So I think actually the, the question as posed is actually in a sense the wrong way around. Um, we're probably researchers, once they start, once we start really paying attention to what we're getting and have to decide whether we buy another pet or publish in this journal versus that journal, that actually we're going to demand much better service and there will be much better value for money and actually I think quality will go up as a result of that. So I can see what's happening here. You've got almost all the mics. So. <laughs> 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 could, I, could I just make a very quick because and this is this is really a comment. I mean I'm, I'm I, I would make this anyway whether or not I'm a publisher. Um, I would suggest to you that actually green open access doesn't work very well and it's uh, the least best option to achieve what we're all trying to do. There was an observatory experiment funded by the European Commission at some expense that reported in May last year called PEER, P -E -E -R, and I've forgotten what it stands for, it's something like Publishing in the Ecology of European Research or something like that. You can find it on the internet. Very simply, there were 300 journals that um, were the green deposit was handled by the publishers and 300 journals were the authors were encouraged to, hand, to do the green deposit. And the observatory set up a depot and made it easy for, for the process to, to, to happen. Um, and then um, the people running the observatory watched and so forth, what happens and what's the impact and so on. But the, the raw statistic that I remember, which I am only reporting, I'm not leveraging any point here, was this. The publishers deposited 11,000 articles into the depot. The authors deposited 137. Concluding. All right. So now, uh, so let's take a quick point from the side. Yeah, I just want to say first a, about the, the business model we see. There was a great report recently by the, the main organisation that represents the oil industry in the United States that presented an economic analysis of how many solar panels 
would they need to have their business model disrupted? And it turns out it's only two or three percent. Because the issue is not about taking customers away, it's taking away the confidence of investors who previously saw utilities as a defensive stock. Back when I had a high yield dividend paying portfolio a few years ago before the stock market crashed, good timing, Elsevier was in that category. And I think that the issue here about competition and large organizations, uh, I, I disagree with, with what Jason was saying, large organizations in a competitive environment don't become more innovative, they become more uh, lobbyist defensive to try and maintain control of, of what they know because that's what they know and that, that's the way it's been. Innovation really occurs at, at the margins, at the edges. And so we're all going to be watching very carefully with interest what, what's going to happen with the um, Elsevier acquisition of Mendeley. And I think that's um, a slight elephant in the room that I'd be interested to hear more about from the other side. All right. Um. Yeah, um, the acquisition of Mendeley, um, we saw a real opportunity in a fabulous company um, and it fits in with our um, uh, innovation strategy and it fits in with our um, want to, en en what am I trying to say, to enable research productivity and Mendeley have done a fantastic job of doing that uh, and en enabling um, social networks within researchers and allowing the sharing of material and to discuss the uh, scientific <coughs> world and we believe that that fits perfectly with enhancement of the, um, the researcher activity and we think they can bring in um, a lot of new and good ideas into Elsevier and we can also invest in them to help them to develop further as well. And, you know, we, will, we are going to leave Mendeley uh, to their own um, devices. You know, it, we will invest in them and they will grow based on that. And certainly my new colleague is speaking tomorrow morning uh, at the conference and I'm sure he will also get uh, similar sorts of questions. But we see it as a real positive step. Yeah, I, I, it is a very interesting step and very uh, topical. Um, is anyone from this side of the panel care to speak about the, the Mende Elsevier thing beyond that? I mean, feel free to. Jason has yeah. some knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few people read my comment about the Mende acquisition. Um, What's in the fish show you about the <laughs> uh, I used to be the head of R&D at Mende before I left to found KOJ. And at that time, this, is, uh, this represents Elsevier's uh, stance on innovation. Uh, they actually tried to shut down several, several of our innovative projects while I was there, including the Open API, their content in the Open API, and uh, PDF reviews. So I think that's kind of hints at how Elsevier approaches uh, anything that begins with the word open. Uh, Indeed. All right. <laughs> Strong opinion there from uh, Jason. Um, so I think it's about time that we had um, some something back from the uh, the audience here. Uh, I can see if there are any questions in this general area that we can talk about. Is anyone burning with a question that they they'd like to ask? Okay. I see. Any... All right. Okay, so let me uh, try this because this is something I'm just quite interested in myself. So, um, of those of you who feel that you have some sense of what green open access and gold open access mean, which I, I guess is most of the people here, I'm going to now ask. Uh, what should I ask? Um, so, it is quite a controversial topic uh, which one one should um, push forward towards. Uh, so, the UK um, has, uh, has you know, made a statement that we're going for. What I'd like to know is. Uh, by a show of hands, who feels that some kind of variant of green open access is really we, we, we should be focusing? And then we're going to ask who's really in favour of gold. And so please, everybody who feels that you know the topic, try and, I know it's a complex one, but try and go for one or the other. So, and can be people on the panel... Oh, I'm going to ask you for a clarification. Okay, go. Because I think there may be people who feel that gold is where we want to get to, but green is a strategy to get there. So are you asking about what we should do now, or where we want to be in 10 years? I think I'm asking about what we want to do now, because it's now that uh, essentially we have this, uh, this government statement that that's what we should be doing. So, for those of you who think uh, you possibly can um, go for one or the other, including people on the panel, can I ask um, who's going to vote green? Sorry, that's not a political thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, okay. So a handful of people, I can say, you know, sort of five, six people. And how about gold? Do we have anybody? Oh, okay, gold is distinctly more popular. That's quite interesting. I'd say twice, not three times, comfortably more people. All right, that is interesting. Um, so, um, anyone like to make a remark, comment yes. on the back of that? A couple of people, several people actually. So we, we uh, okay. There is gold and gold, as I mentioned That's before. That's very true, of course. And the only true gold is <coughs> gold which is open for reuse. And not just for eyeball. Content. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, and we're going to come on to copyrights in a moment. Um, so, you know, all right. So there was actually, I don't know if you can go all the way down there, Victoria. There was a question. Would you still like to make a, a remark? So, right, about that. This time. Skip. Um, I'm um, the publisher of a gold practice. Um, one of my concerns about the recent qualification with the recommended uh, bid report is that um, it has basically given a license to existing journals, existing journal publishers um, to mandate uh, publish uh, or, or allow a hybrid Hybrid. So uh, British uh, academics can pay the agency and then for a um, So it's actually, there is, no, there is absolutely no cost saving overall the fact that there will be more double dip and it will get more more expensive. Double dipping, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, well, and actually, I should put, so I just um, had a paper accepted for Nature Communications and I paid, or rather the university paid, quite a substantial fee to have that made open access. Um, I was just, I'm actually genuinely curious. Does that, the number of, because quite a lot, I don't know, it looked to me like a third or something, of the articles in Nature Communications seem to have opted to, to pay extra and be immediately available um, on a reasonably open license or not, though not CC BY. Um, does that actually, or will, are you expecting that to adjust, therefore, the um, fee that you charge to libraries uh, for access to the journal? Nature Communications is a weird example okay. of a hybrid journal, in actual fact. What, so let's take a step back. Nature Communications, when it launched, it was the very first journal that had a substantial amount of a pretty equal hybrid rate. In actual fact, about the first nine months of it launching, it had a 50 50 split between non OA and OA. Since that time, the amount of the percentage of OA has fallen mm. and has now fallen to about 30%. <coughs> but over that time, the number of submissions have increased to just under a thousand submissions a month. Alongside that, because of the way the journals run, the editors have increased from four editors at launch to 26 editors today. Those are scientific editors with PhDs who are peer reviewing the content. So, so you're, 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 you're painting the picture there of a growing journal. I am painting the picture of a growing journal. But, so obviously a journal may grow and it's costly grow and so forth, but I mean, is it, is it your policy or is it your desire, so to speak, that if a, if a journal, you know, allowing for growth or if a journal was static or whatever, that you would lower the costs of the library corresponding to the income, i.e., what's your policy on double dipping? So, taking next communications out of that, what's the policy? Okay. So, the policy is that as OA grows, there is a formula to work out. A very simple formula, which is how much content was published in the previous year, how much content was published in this year, mm -hmm. that is OA. If that is greater than 10%, the price goes down by 10%. Okay. And if it's greater than 15%, 15 it goes down by 15%. If it's greater than 50%, it goes down by 50%. Okay. That's a standard hybrid model. MPG is being very, very clear. We actually, even on the website, if you go to the website, and please forgive me, I cannot remember the URL, you will now start to find the, percent, the OA percentage for our journals online. And so you can check what percentage of our content for our hybrid journals are open access. And you can also look at what the prices are. And the prices will scale down. Fair enough. Does that satisfy you, sir? <coughs> no. 
Well, well, it, it doesn't satisfy me because oh. your, your policy then is that you do double dip for any by a small amount because you go up in these five percent increments. At any point in between, you're receiving more in article processing charges than you're discounting the subscription. The ten percent is statistical level to mean that you're not going price up and down, up and down, up and down. And ten percent acts as a point that mean that statistically you can level out the deviations in the price, meaning that librarians in the long term have the ability to plan and budget okay. that price. I'm going to use my executive powers to uh, just invite Bob over here to ask a question, because I see he's very keen. Thanks, Dr. Bob Campbell. I think I ought to speak because I, I may be the only member of the Fitch group here. Mm -hmm. I may be the only member of the Fitch group here today, and we just have uh, heard this uh, comment. Uh, it is a good one, because we suddenly, the Fitch group discussed a huge, a great deal the cost of moving the scholarly communication system over to uh, the open access models. Uh, we had the support of this research council, they, they were, uh, had representatives on the Finch Group, and they're well aware that initially there could be uh, a slightly higher cost, it could actually be slightly spent more expensive, the idea being that it's expensive, it's hard work to push a boulder up a hill. But the idea is once you've got over the hill, down the other side, um, it should be a much better situation. So, yes, we were aware that for a year or two, perhaps even three or four years, and that's, that's what we modelled, that the total cost would be higher as the system switches over. And there was a lot of emphasis on transparency, and Research Council of the UK um, are going to be very careful about the money they're spending and we'll be watching the way universities spend that money very carefully. And uh, you know, there, there, is, there is going to be some sort of double dipping for perhaps two or three years, but I don't think publishers get away with it very long. And as the system switches, um, I think it's worth, it's worth making that investment, but it is a big investment. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I guess that's something we'll, just, we'll be interested to, if it's very quick then. Everyone who's saying, saying it's very quick and they've been talking for four minutes, so... <laughs> Green gold is the wrong question to be asking. Um, repositories are just publishers. A different kind of publisher, perhaps, um, but they're just publishers. Please speak up, please. Green and gold is the wrong question to ask, um, and it's the, the, the complete misuse of the terminology in the, in the debate over the past six months has meant that actually we can't even have a sensible conversation about this. Um, I think, it's, I think we should be asking questions about what services we want, what types of publishers we want, how they operate, and how we, how we move forward. Okay. I also see one question from one of my co-organisers, uh, Victoria, so go. Um, I'm actually interested in what you guys will think of what Tim Gowers is calling diamond open access. I don't know if you know about that. Okay. Yes. Fine. So, would you care to define that for everybody? Yes, diamond <coughs> open access, um, it's also sometimes called platinum open access, is just a term for gold open access where the article processing charge is zero. And in fact, that's extremely common. Um, Peter Suber's survey of open access journals shows that well over half of all open access journals charge no article processing fee at all. Um, now, my guess would be that although it's more than half of journals, it would be less than half of articles because it would be the smaller journals on the whole. Um, society journals, you know, run for uh, altruistic reasons. But nevertheless, there are a large number of them out there. Um, and of course, it's great. That's, that's what everybody really wants, isn't it? Something that doesn't cost to publish in and doesn't cost uh, to read. Um, um, we'll all admit, and I'm sure the people on the other side of the table will be quick to agree, that there just are costs when publishing happens. There is real work that happens albeit not quite as much as they sometimes imply. And that does need to be paid for somehow and by someone. But in some cases, uh, these journals are supported by scholarly societies, in some cases directly by government departments, uh, and in some cases just by individual academics putting in the work. Um, I wonder how many more will see them, but I think there will always be um, a very large segment where the, there's an obvious flow of money rather than just being done pro bono. Right, unless anyone's burning with a remark, I think what it, we might do now is just move on quickly. So the next thing I have here in my list to sort of talk about, the next debate topic, is really copyright and the nature of copyright. And so um, just as a provocative thought, uh, what we have here is um, in order to make the best use of the new possibilities that come with the internet, do we need a whole new attitude to copyright protection of scientific reports and data? 
So I think that's a, quite a large question, but uh, we'll see where we go with it. Uh, I can't remember which side had the first go last time. <coughs> they had it. No, I think we did. You did. So it's over to you guys. Um, what would you like to say about that? Yeah, so how to deal with the internet is a bit of a big question. And um, what do we do with the internet in our smart meters, in our homes, and in our cars? What if your brakes are controlled uh, by a wireless apparatus, for instance, and somebody is able to hack that apparatus? That, that would be a big problem for you when you're trucking down the highways. Um, and then we have the copyright issue, which the Commission conveniently snuck into the cloud computing strategy just recently, which was also ridden with all of these privacy issues that are very contentious in Germany and in, in Austria. So um, I think we need to change copyright, not only because of the internet, but because the copyright system is um, obscene and it's creating a lot of damage to a lot of public institutions that we value and that we've had for a long time, like libraries. Um, we as, and I speak now very loosely of politicians as a collective because we have a lot of animosity in our community. Um, we have difficulties identifying our goals in the terms of interactions between people. What, the, what politicians that make legislations actually do is try to make as few conflicts as possible arise between as few individuals as possible and make it so that when those conflicts nevertheless arise, because of course they do, they will be as painless as possible to resolve. The copyright system does the opposite. It makes a lot of conflicts arise and it makes the conflicts that do occur very difficult to resolve. That to me is a very strong indication that something needs to be done about it. But then, so we talked earlier about why is it that governments now go in and, and try to mandate open access publishing in funding grants? Well, it's because actually we can't deal with the copyright system. Um, we don't know how to reform this. We're not able to get it through a political debate. The database rights that I've been addressing very aggressively about earlier is a perfect example. We created in 1997 a directive uh, that created a sui generis copyright for databases in the European Union so that the database industry in Europe would thrive. At the 10 year anniversary of the directive, we made an evaluation at the European level about whether or not this directive had actually reached its goals. And we found that actually database production in Europe had slowed down since we introduced the directive. Um, and it was also costing money, and we also have seen uh, fewer new actors in the database market, but a strong consolidation of the strong database actors. Nevertheless, we concluded that because many of the large publishers had made business models based on the database rights, it would be too costly to repeal this directive that wasn't doing anything of that which we wanted it to do. So we have a clear problem in that our politicians are unable to identify their role and unable to take responsibility for these monopoly rights that we are creating on behalf of companies. I don't think that it's meaningful to discuss with Elsevier or any other publisher really what we should be doing about these rights because they're a private company that we have legally obliged to protect their shareholders and their owners. So they have to do that. They cannot meaningfully come to the legislators or to this panel and say, let's give us weaker rights. That would be stupid and probably in contradiction of some uh, creditor respect law. Um, but now as politicians, of course, we have to hear all of the stakeholders. So we end up sitting around not knowing what to do, listening to all of the stakeholders, one of which is obliged to protect its own interests, and the other one, which in this case would be researchers, but in many cases also citizens, simply isn't competent enough or knowledgeable enough on, the, on these topics to be able to push forward effectively a political arguments towards their politicians. Um, in terms of how to solve that, I, I'm not really sure. Mandating open access when you give public funding to research projects seems to me a good way, because at least you're pulling out some of the strands of this behemoth of a publishing industry that otherwise we cannot deal with. Um, it's looking very likely that the only way that we'll ever be able to have um, terms of interaction and dealing with communication and all those kind of data flows is by, um, well, picking the intellectual property rights framework to pieces through um, ancillary legislation, competition law, um, stricter access and what the stricter requirements of what we do with public money um, because in the other or alternatively actually you could vote for a different political party 
Um, I think that that would help. All politicians are ultimately populist and are dependent on their voters. And therefore, if you show, show them that you will no longer support somebody who is not able to um, actually determine what is the role of a politician in society, um, they may be more inclined to change. Okay, that's provocative. So, uh, any remarks on this side in response to that? David again. <coughs> well, I was the, I was the uh, person uh, <coughs> um, So, in the event of um, a vote on access, and, and as, um, as Amelia says, there's been a lot of interaction with funding bodies uh, mandating uh, specific user rights. And let's be honest, we, we also need to make a segregation here between um, author rights um, and user rights. And very much um, authors do have concerns about how their uh, material is used and what other people can then do with that material. It's, it's something that um, if you ask the majority of authors out there what they think about it, they will have at least some concern in the majority of what people can then do with their information. And I think open access has brought that to, it's brought that to the common understanding and there's been a lot of questions about uh, licensing um, and you know we can talk about creative commons and all of that sort of licensing for aid. Um, but it's brought it to everyone's attention and you know as a colleague from Nature has said and as many publishers are doing now we're giving authors the options on how they want material to be used and um, certainly as, as David said um, Gold Open Access with reuse is something that we're offering you know, if you publish Gold Open Access with us, um, you get the option of how you want your material to be reused. Um, and if that's by Creative Commons, CC BY or whatever, it's the author's choice. Um, on the data side of things, of course, um, we're, we're supportive of open data and we want data to be shared. And certainly with, um, because data is not, you know, it's, it's facts that you can't copyright. Um, you know, if, if there's any content, any data provided, we will make that available. We encourage people to put their data in repositories and share that data. Um, so I think things are changing a lot from a licensing perspective, but it's still a very, very misunderstood area by the majority of researchers. And I, I will also say it is also one of the most misunderstood topics from publishers as well. I think that uh, it's actually right that a lot of academics don't really understand the subtleties here. I mean, when I first became aware of the option, and in fact, interestingly enough, the conference or the debate, rather like this one that took place a year ago, when we came to prepare the forms for it, the idea was to release it under CC by NC, that's Oxford's um, preferred route. And it seemed to me that that was a pretty good way to go, because if you're receiving these ideas for the first time, you're thinking, yes, why should someone else you know, make money off of that? That's a bit cheeky, isn't it? Why don't I just ban that? But then when you think it through, you realize that, that actually that can really constrain a lot of interesting innovation and a lot of new possibilities. So I think one of the reasons authors may be selecting you know, surprising options or restrictive options is just they, they aren't sufficiently educated on the subtleties of these different licenses. And I think if they heard, if, you know, that was my kind of epiphany, was to realize that it was actually harming the distribution of my material to put that NC on, even though it kind of, it's, it's my first thought was, yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, I really have to ask, um, is anyone here burning with a question on the sort of the copyright area, any of these kind of... Yeah? Simon, could I just oh. make a remark? Yeah, and, very um, quick. Looking back at your original question, it, it says in order to make best use of the new possibilities that come with the internet, in particular systematic machine analysis of research papers, do we need a whole new attitude to copyright protection? Well, um, we're about to change copyright for just that, actually, in, in this country. The current white paper on harmonizing copyright, which will produce secondary legislation in the autumn, I should think one um, element of that is that um, researchers who have legitimate access, which would be open access or, or licensed access to um, whatever articles they're interested in mining, um, will have the right to do so. Yeah. 
under the legislation. legislation. That's, That's not, not the same, same as having the right to access the publisher's platform to do so. You still, still have to negotiate a license to make the mine, because you have to, as I understand it, you have to copy first to make the mine. You can't just go plundering around or science direct. Okay, okay. So, so, but it's happening. All right, right. good. So, so um, I, I see a couple of hands actually. Victoria, thank you for running around. around. Um, so, 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 certainly, uh, this chap here yeah, hasn't spoken before I do things. So, this is that. It's <laughs> waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> waiting at the back, back there. Um, um, yeah, um, as, as loud as loud. Can, can you hear me? I just now. So, can you hear me? Yes, that's the sort of level. A lot of research fields uh, that used to rely on public funding are now being pushed towards finding money in the industry. And as anyone who's watched uh, the Dragon's Den before, um, the industry is interested in things that really generate intellectual property that can be protected. And one of the things that worries me with open access and CC BY licensing is that a lot of industry partners that we used to have as researchers, I was a researcher before moving to publishing, the industry is interested in things that they can protect, okay. things that they can keep for themselves. And, okay, in some areas, it might not matter that much, but yeah. as a material yeah, I mean, I, scientist, for example, okay, so it does I, matter. I take your point that, um, that, that at the interface between academia and industry, we have the whole question of uh, protecting stuff for commercial reasons. I think probably you'd, be, you'd struggle to patent something if you published it on, on any kind of terms. Um, would you signaling you'd like to make a quick remark there? I mean, so we were negotiating the Horizon 2020 package. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I need to, like this, you can hear me? Yeah, just really shout as loud as you can bear to. Yeah, okay, so we were negotiating the Horizon 2020 package in the European Parliament last year. And that is, of course, the framework program of the European Union for distributing research money into all the European research institutions. And we had a lot of dialogues with industry also because they have permanent representatives in Brussels that, that come to see us. Um, and what they said was that they could envisage, actually, like they were very close to mandatory open access also because industry realizes that ultimately they benefit a lot from open standards and open research and that kind of publishing as well. Um, but sometimes for some publications or for some data, they could see that it would be useful to put in the grant maybe an exclusivity period of 12 to 24 months. The reaction of the European Parliament to the, to the exclusivity request of 24 months was to not make open access mandatory at all, but make it the kind of optional that we now have to negotiate for every research project, which is quite silly because that means that all of the data and all of the publications will fall, not, fall under copyright or database rights, which last for over a hundred years, which is more than 50 times as long as industry was asking for as a maximum. Um, and so th that is for a perspective that industry exclusivity, like, okay, we can negotiate, but for very short periods of time. Okay, so that's a, a nice point. So what I can do, because we're running out of time now, I think I can take uh, one more question, if there is another question on this copyright area, and then I'm going to combine, okay, uh, well, there are two. I had to say no. Uh, no, oh, you choose, Victoria, I can't make my mind up. <laughs> Just go and give it to the first guy. Huh? David's got a better suit. Oh, well, there we are. <laughs> so, can you make it a quick one? And we'll try res to respond quickly as well. Because we can't. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say I'll be brief and then take 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, my, th my point on, I'm, I'm a very big supporter of open access, very big supporter of CC BY. My huge worry is that we've moved into, especially in this transition period, into a, a real mess. So, we have hundreds of open access journals where there, it is not at all clear what the rights are. We have the new um, uh, research uh, councils policies where the rights are different depending on which route you go down. If it's gold, it's one set of rights. If it's green, it's another set of rights. Uh, we have papers from publishers who are giving authors who used to just blithely sign away all their copyrights are now being asked to make informed decisions about which rights they want. When we look back on this in 20, 30 years' time, hopefully it will all sort itself out. Okay. But we're going to have this period, which is a huge it mess. It is a huge mess. Any instantaneously quick remarks from the... Yes. I'm very glad you mentioned that, because it touches on something that I'm extremely angry about. 
and that is that when the RCUK policy was first released in, in I think April last year, it was an excellent, very progressive open access policy, and it was consistent about requiring the CC by license, whether the gold or green route was taken. Now, somewhere along the line, someone nobbled them, and I have no idea who that might have been. <laughs> and as a result, the green arm of that policy now allows this poisonous non-commercial clause that greatly reduces the value of published research to industry, to education, uh, uh, to medicine. Um, and I do not understand why RCUK allowed that to happen, and I don't understand why the Finch report left open that possibility. So that's a great sadness. That's, uh, this would have to be a one sentence, if you will. It, it is a one sentence. Yeah, I just picked up on what David was saying, really, and what Jason was saying about the, the licenses that were being chosen by their authors. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, no. We shouldn't keep adding proliferation. We shouldn't keep adding licenses. Okay, I, I, I agree. We shouldn't allow them to proliferate anymore. I think that's an interesting point. I think I completely agree. There's already a confusing. In fact, let's have a quick vote. So, um, how can we? <laughs> so, let's let's let's. Uh, I'm going to offer the following suggestion, and I'd like everyone to try and vote yes or no. Gold open access should always be associated with something at least as permissive as CC BY. Okay? Um, everyone's got to vote yes or no, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> Too keen then, John. Okay, so um, hands up if you agree that gold open access should be at least as open as CC BY as we understand it. Okay, so that's a sense how many people that is. And then please um, put your hands up. I won't pick on anyone, but put your hands up if you just disagree for any reason with that assertion. Okay, so a very small number of people disagreeing with that, and I promise not to pick on them, so I won't ask why. <laughs> okay, all right, so... Can um, you ask the same question about green? Uh, no. <coughs> I think, I think, well, I think gold, you know, you're paying for it, so I think that's why it's particularly interesting. So I'm going to now fuse together the last two questions, because we are running low on time. The last two questions were really, um, will this whole drive towards open access lead to higher or <coughs> lower standards in science? We might in particular be concerned with the new thinking on peer review. So, for example, as, as Jason told us there, is that actually going to lower standards, never mind the other aspects? And I'm going to roll that into the general question of where we want to be. Where do we want to be in five to ten years' time? So I think um, if anyone on the panel has like got strong thoughts on what they, they'd like to sort of give us a little vision, but it would have to be quite quick. I know it's a huge issue, it's a huge thing to ask for, but if anyone's really burning with a, with a sort of remark on, okay, um, which side had go, I'm terrible um, adjudicator here, Cameron go. So, I think the question is flawed, and the question is flawed mm -hmm. for exactly the reason that Mike gave in his opening remarks. There is not a scala natura of the quality of research. There is a question of the usability of research in different contexts, for different purposes, by different people, with different concerns. And as we move to a space where people can interact with research and where people can make a record of those interactions, then we will have much richer information about the different kinds of uses to which research can be put the different types of things that research has been used for, and the question of, is this useful for what I need to do with it today, will be so much easier to answer, <coughs> and it is so much easier to answer when the data, the records, and the systems are all completely open. And if we can get to that, then we will have solved the problems, and I think that's where we should be in five or ten years' time. Um, sorry. Nice. Yeah, so um, just on, on the question of, sort of uh, data and publishing and that kind of thing, uh, one book I'd recommend very highly is Bad Pharma, uh, by Ben Goldberg, which talks a lot about the issues of access to data and the difficulty that one actually has in doing systematic reviews of uh, information in clinical trials. And I think the potential of having more eyes uh, being able to attempt to replicate studies, being able to pick holes in the data, because I'm a scientist, uh, human error is supposed to be 1% or something, like that means I've probably made several thousand. Um, you know, I, I think that more eyes on this thing can, can do good. We've also seen um, through collaborative crowdsourcing projects like Kaggle, that sometimes other people might come up with a better solution uh, than you have, and you can only really free that up if you make that data available. So the future in which I want to live is one which uh, every patient's experience through their electronic medical records or through scientific observations contributes 
towards the, the benefits that each subsequent uh, patient experiences uh, with uh, an increasing level of rigor achieved through transparency and innovation. So, just I'm told I have two minutes for this, so I, I promise I'll try to be <coughs> To answer the question of with open access, will the quality of science go up or will it go down? Uh, I have two points to make there. Uh, I think it's first that it's a falsehood to believe that there must be a trade off between quality and price uh, and open access. And the example that we can look at there is the auto manufacturing industry. In the 1980s, over in Japan, of course, Japanese auto manufacturing skyrocketed, while at the same time in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States, uh, it went down the tubes. And the difference was that the Japanese were able to prove that you could produce higher quality uh, automobiles for an even lower price. And the same is actually true with open access in our scientific literature. We can produce higher quality open access uh, literature at a lower price. The second point is that it was earlier at the, in the opening remarks, it was stated that peer review came about in 1665. Well, this is true, but it actually, in fact, it wasn't formally practiced on a regular basis until the mid 20th century. In fact, in case Noble can uh, perhaps verify this, at Nature, uh, peer review did not become standardized until around 1965 or 66. Uh, and famously, Albert Einstein, out of all the papers that he ever published, only a single paper was ever peer reviewed. Uh, also famously, something I mentioned earlier, the Watson and Crick double helix paper published in Nature was never peer reviewed either. So we have to ask the question, that if all these papers prior to the 1960s were hardly ever peer reviewed, or at least didn't have a standardized formal peer review, was that literature any worse than what it is today? And in fact, we can look today and see there's highly more errors occurring today, there's more fraud occurring today, and there are more retractions occurring today despite having peer review. And part of the problem is because for one reason, peer review has been usurped by publishers in order to uh, put a false filter in the a, a paywall behind things, saying that it costs money to publish things, so we're only going to uh, filter it by, by peer review and thus reduce what we're having to actually print and, and ship off. And the second thing is that it's been usurped by scientists themselves, uh, which we all know if you've ever been through the peer review process, uh, it's quite a grueling thing, uh, and oftentimes scientists will hide behind uh, anonymous peer reviews uh, to either unfairly criticize uh, their, their colleagues or uh, uh, give hardly uh, any evidence to why a paper should be rejected. Open peer review, on the other hand, is something that can solve these problems. Okay, um, so would you guys, would you like, Jacob, would you like to respond to that question? Well, I wasn't going to respond to that. Okay. But if you want to, I can hand it over. No, no, we're in a last I mean, so, I, I, I so would say like. just from, from my point of view about the discussion there about peer review, I totally and utterly disagree with everything you just said about peer review. <laughs> and I think most scientists in general would disagree as well. Peer review has helped science. If you talk to scientists, they do say on the whole that peer review has helped improve their research. And, and reviewers will say that they believe that they have helped improve their research. So peer review plays a very vital role I'm in science. I'm not saying abolish peer review, I'm saying make it open so that there's transparency and accountability. And there have been experiments and Nature's experimented and found very little success. And if you look at the surveys that are out there, lots of people have indicated that open peer review hasn't had the success we want it to. But does that mean in the future it won't work? I don't know. What I just wanted to come on to, though, was about a vision about 10 years. What we've talked about here is a lot about licensing and how we utilize the research unit that is currently published today. I think there needs to be a revolution in terms of what are we publishing and what are you publishing as scientists as a research unit? The paper today is still the same as it was in the 17th century. It hasn't changed. The internet, all it has done is allow you to take a bit of paper and put it on here. That's it. That's all that's changed. Whereas we've had lots of discussions about data and other things around it. The research paper today doesn't have data in it. It doesn't have data associated with it. Most publishers don't even get the data, the raw data submitted to them when the paper goes through the system. What I believe and hope we will see in 10 years is a system where we start to see the unit of publication break down. 
We start to see that data is more available. We start to see that the understanding of how that data was collected, how that data was interpreted, how that data was made available, is available for anybody to read alongside the raw data. And that ultimately the conclusions, which is essentially what a research article is today, is available as well. And you break an article down into three individual elements. And it's only with that that we will fulfill what the funders want and what Newton once said, which is we want to stand on the shoulders of giants. And when you've got those three elements, you will be able to trust the science that's out there, you'll be able to trust what people have done, fraud won't be the problem that fraud is today, and it means that people won't have to go back to a paper, read it, redo all the experiments, replicate the results, prove themselves that it's right, waste about a year doing that, and then go on and do some more research. That's what I believe we should be doing, and that's what I believe science should be doing. And unfortunately, we just haven't touched on that in the time we've had in the debate. Glad you raised it. Yeah. So I'd say the fundamental problem that we've had is that certainly those of us my age and older grew up in a, a pre-internet time when economies were based on things. So if I buy a chair from you, you don't have your chair anymore. So chairs have a scarcity, naturally, too. And because of that, we've mostly grown up thinking that that's how economies work, that they're always based on scarcity. And that a paper is a scarce thing. And so that a paper itself has value, which is why I think we're left with a, a subscription model after the, the physical need for it is gone. So of course now, in an internet time, uh, uh, each copy of a paper is, is of zero cost. Once the thing has been produced, distributing it costs nobody anything. I'm not saying there's no production cost, but the marginal cost of each copy is zero. So what I really hope we'll see in 10 years' time is a shift in the way of thinking, where we don't think of, of the knowledge that we, as scientists, you know, our job is to make knowledge, and that we don't think of knowledge as a, a, a thing that's scarce and has to be hoarded and doled out for a fee, but that we think of knowledge as being what it is, which is a, a public good, a common good. So I would love that change in, in a whole emphasis of thinking. I think, since we're a few minutes over time, that's a very nice sentiment to end on. So I'd like to uh, thank our panel members, because it's a lot of work being involved in something like this. Good. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, coming along. And uh, for those of you say the vote, if you want to have a vote. All right, well, why not? Okay, no, that's fine. All right, I mean, just for a bit of fun, and it's, I don't think the camera looks likely to even see this, but let's ask everybody to put your hand up, and I'm basically going to say, were you more impressed, interested, do you feel yourself more sympathetic to the arguments you've broadly been hearing from this side or from this side? So, hands up, please, everybody put your hand up, even if it's a bit of a silly one. Hands up for this side of the table. Oh, that's... Uh, yeah, okay. Hands down. Hands up for this side of the table. Yeah, okay. So I would have to say this side of the table won, but this side of the table also had a pretty good go at it. <laughs>